So, uh, my name is Elis Rin Markskog, and we have uh, Fred Esby with us from Dismember, live from New York. How is life in the in the States compared to uh, good old Sweden? I mean, like the biggest difference in the music scene, uh, stuff like that. Well, you know, I've been working here for a couple of years now as a sound engineer, and um, it's uh, it's different in the way that we have more venues here, but they are also very short lived from time to time because leases run out and all that, so it's hard to find new spots. And you know, Live Nation took over a lot of the mid sized venues. AEG are owning some of them. I work for them too. Uh, so it's it's up and down, but it tends to be like when one venue closes down, another one opens up. So in that sense, it's a pretty good rotation. Um, and apart from that, the music scene is very thriving. I mean, I I made so many friends and met so many cool people here in such a short amount of time. You know that it's it's really it's very refreshing to see so many bands and so many venues, you know, hosting a lot of different kind of events and good shows. You know, it's there are shows every weekend or before the pandemic, you know, it's so it's, um, it's a vital scene and I love it. And the people here are really cool. Like there is uh, the majority of, of musicians and bands in New York City are really cool, I would say. And this was your third year in uh, New York? Yes, I moved here uh, in 2016. 2000. So it's the fourth year now. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, was it the love or uh, what was the reason? Yeah. To move? <laughs> yeah, it was love. I, I met a girl here in 2013 when I was on tour here with uh, Nick Anderson's band Imperial State Electric. So we had a long distance relationship, me and Lauren, for a couple of years. And then I decided to move here. Um, and we got married and all that so yeah it's great i'm happy for you <laughs> congrats amazing thanks so uh about this member first of all uh what made you create this member uh, in the in the first place well you know me and nick anderson uh, we've been tight since we were like 13 years old and uh, we used to play a lot together not in any really serious bands. We had like a, they, him and Kenny from the helicopters, they had a punk band uh, when I joined the same school as them in seventh grade. Uh, and I was the only metalhead. They were the only punk guys in school. So we kind of hit it off and they asked me to join the band. So we, we had a band for a short, a brief, brief time there. But when we entered ninth grade, Nick started Nihilist and they rehearsed a little bit at my parents' place sometimes. So it was really cool. And I really loved what they were doing. So I felt like I, I need to start a band too. Uh, because I was just like, this is awesome. You know, and we were both, you know, in the scene. We were tape trading and doing all that. Met a lot of new people from different suburbs of Stockholm. Uh, so I felt like I have to start a band. So I found a couple of guys. Uh, David, who's me and him have been playing together from day one. So I was actually meant to play guitar at the time, uh, but we couldn't find a drummer. So I just decided to harness that role. Awesome. And when you started to play live shows with this member, uh, how was it like uh, uh, crowd-wise? Was it a lot of punks or was it heavy metal people? I mean, since death metal more or less weren't, weren't born. True. I mean, it was very mixed in the beginning. I mean, we could only, since we were underage, we could only play, you know, the, the occupied punk houses around Stockholm, which was great. We owe a lot to the punk scene of Stockholm, the death metal bands, I'd say, especially the first, first generation, because we couldn't, you know, no one would let us play. They didn't understand what kind of music we were playing. Um, we were, we were rehearsing in youth, youth clubs and stuff like that, you know, early on. So, since we were so young, um, we could only play those punk places. And we, we always got the got slots there. So we hung out with a lot of punk musicians and heavy metal musicians. But heavy metal, for the most part, back in those days, were they were bigger events. People came from the countryside to Stockholm to see bigger events like Slayer, Metallica, and so on. And we went to all those shows. But it was kind of hard to, to build a community at first. So everything started with the, the locations where all the punks had 
store it out with their music because that was a free scene for everybody. So it was very DIY. And we kind of liked that concept too because we were into punk rock music and hardcore music. Um, so it, it was a natural step in many ways. And if you wanted to open up for, for bigger heavy metal bands, like we opened up for Hexen House once. I mean, they played like they had a kind of a decent production too for a band like that. And they would play like a uh, like a auditorium in a school or something like that, that they would rent themselves and then we would open up. But a lot of people didn't come out for those shows. So it was pretty mellow. It wasn't that many people into it. Not until I would say 91, we had bigger crowds. Uh, I remember you played in uh, Växjö, Sweden in 2007. And the interest at that moment uh, maybe wasn't that high. Why, uh, why do you think people like worship this member nowadays and uh, are maybe more open to it now than uh, like in 2007? I don't know. I mean, there have been a couple of generations coming along, uh, being into this kind of music, some generational shifts or what have you. Uh, I remember that show in Vecchia in 2007. That was my last live show with this member before I quit the band. And it was pretty underwhelming to see that weren't that many people out for it. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, early 90s, a lot of people, it was a new thing. Uh, magazines were talking about it. You know, people were curious, more or less. Then the black metal scene came along in, in the mid-90s and kind of overpowered all death metal. And death metal wasn't cool anymore. Early 2000s, we had kind of a revival. We started touring more, had more sh people at the shows and so on, more big festivals wanted us on and all that. But then there was a slight dip again, like in the mid 2000s, I feel like. And after I quit, I guess they, I mean, this member still had a good run, a great album out after that and so on. Uh, but now it's, the interest seems to be a lot more... Uh, overwhelming I would say because I didn't really expect this but it seems like I think what happened is that a lot of the younger generations who were into death metal and thrash metal and punk music and rock and roll too they kind of they weren't that restrictive of what you could listen to I mean we were like that in the beginning too we we were kind of like oh you only play death metal or you only you know listen to death metal for the first couple of years maybe from 88 to like 89. I mean, me and Nick, we always listen to other types of music too, but it wasn't really okay to be into wimpy stuff at that time. But we grew out of it pretty quickly and, you know, rehashed old stuff like um, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, uh, Kiss that we loved when we were kids. You know, we got back to that point in the early 90s again that we, we were like, why are we shunning the, old stuff that we always love you can't you know take that out of us so it's kind of stupid to not you know it's not okay to listen to all types of music and i think that the newer generations they don't care about that they like rock and roll they like death metal they like they can even be into dance music you know i when i worked the club in, in brooklyn here we had a lot of late dance nights you know and everything and i i'd had at least like for a techno event where we had like four or 500 people, there would be at least like 10 extreme metal shirt wearing people in the audience, which is pretty cool to me. Everybody likes to party. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And there's no need to differentiate people because of their music taste, you know. And you can always learn something new and you'll find something new that you like that you thought you wouldn't like, you know, if you, it's a little bit open-minded. Amazing man. Um, when you when you spoke about the the late eighties, uh, like what's the biggest uh, difference uh, in the in the scene today, like compared now uh, to then? Mm. I don't know. I I think the internet and Facebook and you know even like early band pages and what did you have back then? I mean Bandcamp and you know, it, MySpace, all that, I, it made a big difference because people could connect in a different way um, and coming together over the, the bands they like. People also have a platform to, you know, have their own opinion, which sometimes can be a, a problem, I guess, with a lot of trolling, but there's also a big upside to it. And that's like, 
you know, you have so many friends across the globe. We made a lot of friends just touring, just by touring. But now people can actually, you know, people from here can online hang out with people from Australia who's into the same kind of music. So I think it's easier today. And you also get information. There's a lot of white noise, of course, but I think you, you have ads in your hand. You know, you know what shows are coming up. You can get alerts. Everything's more convenient in that way. And that also brings people together, even though it's... I. You know, I like the old school ways. We went to parties, we hung out with people in person. It's harder these days. Like when we played Stockholm, the first shows, I was like, I'm going to meet so many people I know in this venue. You know, it's going to be great being back in the band. We're, we're back together and there's going to be so many people we know. And I didn't have time to talk to a lot of people at all, which I was disappointed about that fact. And I think a lot of people who came to the shows were also kind of disappointed that we didn't have more time to say hello because we were always that kind of band that we wouldn't just hang hang out backstage. We would be out in the audience. We would watch the other bands and we would hang out after the shows. But it was a little bit trickier this time, uh, which, you know, it is what it is. I went to a grindcore show in 2011 or 2010 in in Stockholm on a on a small boat. I can't remember the name, and that's true. Your singer was there, and people were like, "Oh, that's the singer in this member." It was a huge <laughs> thing for for grindcore bands. I think it was uh, the Orson Project and and some other band. I um, oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, but uh, about Scandinavia Death Fest, uh, the concerts, uh, the, the, I, I saw one of the concerts in Stockholm and uh, it was absolutely amazing. Uh, Sherby uh, asked me to tell you, uh, Sherby is the promoter of uh, Scene Extreme. He, uh, he told me uh, uh, that I should tell you that he, that he thought the second concert was, uh, was one of the most epic things he ever saw. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. He really, really enjoyed it. So uh, how did you feel about yourselves being back on stage after such a long time? What, uh, what, what was the end of feeling about the gig? Uh, it, it felt like it was yesterday in a sense. I mean, even pulling up to the rehearsal space with all my gear and I see the guys standing outside, you know, I haven't seen some of them for many years. You know, it was a great feeling. It felt like, oh, no time has passed. We look a little older, but... We started rehearsing, felt great, and on on stage it felt like you know always has you know no difference in that sense. The the cool thing though was that uh, I felt that the audience was like it was a big difference, you know, because people were over enthusiastic, which was awesome. And uh, at uh, Scandinavia Death Fest, uh, we saw you give a big, genuine hug to uh, to Nick Anderson, and you told uh, uh, yeah you told us a bit about him earlier. But uh, it's true that he created the logo, he helped with the debut album, even the name, right? So, yep. Uh, is he, uh, could you call him like the godfather of this member? Yeah, I would say so. That's a that's a good one. Never heard that before. But that's a <laughs> that's a good label for him. I mean, he helped out a lot. You know, he encouraged me to play drums. He he more or less taught me how to play drums. Uh, and you know, he he drew the logo, came up with a name, and he helped out playing bass, lead guitar when we needed it, when we were only a three piece and all that. So he he played a a huge role. And he, he drew, you know, he drew our demo covers, stuff like that, you know, never asked for anything in return, just, you know, being a really good friend. Very supportive. Everybody should, uh, should have one of those. <laughs> I know, right? 